Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm here with a special guest today. This is Ryan Muldowney, or Professor Muldowney, or since we're at a church school, Brother Muldowney. Um, and I'm here to talk about him and his recent 2018 book, Not Art, which you can find on Amazon if you're interested. <laughs> Tell me about your motivation to write this book. Okay, yeah, so as an educator, um... You know, I've, I've uh, taught a variety of different types of classes, uh, and one of the classes that I, I taught fairly regularly was this uh, kind of art appreciation class. It was sort of like a 100 level class for mostly non-majors. Um, and you know, we'd spend the whole semester kind of, um, I guess, dancing around this idea of what is art um, as part of this class. And it was kind of, uh, you know, it was fun for me as an ed educator to sort of pose tricky questions and sort of lay traps for the students and uh, and sort of hear what they had to think about you know one thing or another you know the reality of what emerged from these conversations is that uh, almost nobody in my classes had a really sort of strong notion of what art was and it's not to be you know it's not surprising since art sort of, uh, you know, it's almost like the dark arts, right? It's sort of always, uh, you know, merging, adapting, evolving, changing. Um, and so that makes it sort of somewhat difficult to pin down. And so uh, my motivation to write this book was uh, to try and see if I could make a formal argument and create sort of a, a tool that would help students kind of at least sift away some of the things that don't really belong in a uh, conversation about art. Because that was one of the difficulties, is that a lot of my conversations would get bogged down in uh, people talking about things that were clearly not art as art. And then that just sort of, you know, it fogs up the issue, makes it difficult to kind of actually see clearly what what is art and what are, what are the potential benefits of sort of identifying art. So this, this book was a, in, in a number of ways, just a way to try and create a, a clarifying argument um, to kind of point people at least a little closer to the, the right kind of answers, the right kind of talking points. Okay. So, I mean, you did it for a class, essentially, is when you were first inspired to? Well, yes. Uh, you think that, you know, such a book, essentially, or such a discussion or a formal analysis, essentially, would, you, would that be useful for any art class like that? Art appreciation, is that what you said? Um, yeah, it could be. It could be. You know, <laughs> it was a lot of these kind of repetitive conversations about not art topics in an art context that sort of made me kind of start thinking about it. And what really got me thinking about it was a very kind of obdurate class that I had that were insistent that everything was art and they'd sort of point out everything and I'd sort of give them examples and anecdotes and a historical context that sort of said no that's not really true and they, they, they were kind of they were they stuck to their guns and so I walked out of that class one day after a very sort of intense discussion and I said all right I need a formal tool here <laughs> And so I started by developing this taxonomy that the book's based on, and then uh, after after I developed the taxonomy, it was um, it made sense to sort of explain each of the layers of the taxonomy, and the book project just seemed like the natural way to go for that. And it, maybe it's just like uh, students are innately stubborn, um, but <laughs> well, so are professors. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like. I can see it being sort of controversial if you're, they think, if they're adamant something is art and it's not really, like, so do you think that essentially the book in general or the taxonomy could be controversial? Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. Art is a very curious practice. I think that if you were to go to a sort of a tea party with a bunch of top level, you know, uh, theoretical mathematicians or physicists and they started talking about the nature of the cosmos, right, then you wouldn't sort of interject and say, oh, I, think, I don't think E equals MC squared, right? You, you would kind of like, be like, oh wow, these guys, uh, they know a lot and uh, you wouldn't sort of, sort of insert your own opinion on the nature of the cosmos or the nature of, the, you know, physics or, or theoretical mathematics or things like that. But for whatever reason, when it comes to art, everyone feels like they have an equal stake in the venture and that their opinion is just as valuable as anyone else's. And uh, moreover, people are very sensitive to the idea of maybe disenfranchising or kind of saying, oh, something is an art, because we have this sort of cultural idea about what art means. You know, a lot of times we talk about art as the sort of highest level of, you know, human achievement. You know, my 
My father-in-law is a surgeon, and he likens his skills to Picasso. He's a urogynecological sur surgeon, and he says he's the Picasso of the perineum, right? Uh, you know, people will say, oh, my dentist, he's an artist with a drill, or my drywall guy, you know, he makes an art out of, you know, hanging sheetrock, or, you know, my, my, uh, my uh, auto body guy, you know, he's a real artist with Bondo and one of those scrapers, right? Um, you know, we, we kind of, this kind of language, these, these terminologies uh, where we kind of compare something at its highest level to art, it's just kind of endemic, it's everywhere, and we think about it that way just because we often associate art as being the highest thing, the highest achievement. Whether we really believe that or not, every parent everywhere encourages their children not to become artists. So <laughs> that's, like that's like the flip side of it. We, we honor art, but at the same time we don't want our children to be making it. But that's just sort of a weird curiosity that we often mistakenly think art is like the crown jewel of civilization. And by saying something is not art, we're saying that it's of lesser value. And therefore we're kind of, um, you know, you know, tossing uh, certain enterprises or undertakings away, and that feels offensive. So it could certainly seem controversial, but but uh, the reality is, is uh, the peak of human achievement is not art. Art is merely just one of the ways in which we try to achieve uh, peak human achievement. You know, an analogy I use in the book is a mountain, right? Um, a lot of people think of, a, you know, you have a mountain, a big mountain with a peak at the top, and then there's these little ridges and spurs and stuff going down to the plain. A lot of people think that, oh, urogynecological surgery, I'm, I go up that part of the mountain and it'll eventually lead me to art. Or auto body work, I go up this part of the mountain over here, it'll lead me to art. Or over here's, uh, you know, hanging sheetrock, and I sort of can go up that and it'll lead me to art. Th that's, that's a fallacy. Art's not at the top. Art's actually at the bottom with all of these things. Auto body work, cabinet making, you know, whatever. Uh, and so that leads us to the question of what is at the top, and the top is truth, right? I think uh, I don't go far astray when I suggest that the that all worthwhile human endeavor is based on drawing closer to the truth. And so we can draw closer to the truth, which is the actual top of the mountain, through a variety of ways. It could be through science, right? It could be through math. Um, it could be through philosophy. Um, it could be through art, uh, as well as animal husbandry, as agriculture, or, you know, uh, as I said, cabinet making. There's a variety of ways that we can sort of draw closer to the truth, and uh, there's a whole lot of ways it can happen. Art is merely one of them. And so I, I think the idea is if we can understand that saying something is not art doesn't mean that it's not the high, it's not worthwhile. It just means that it doesn't go up the mountain leading to truth along the same paths, right? It's just going up the mountain in a different way. And ultimately, right, we, we all believe that all truth is going to sort of be gathered together in one. We all believe that at some point we'll achieve the top of the mountain where we can see all truth completely. Um, that's not something we'll achieve in this life, but it's something we hope for, uh, certainly. And so when we think of going up the mountain on one side or the other, you know, there's going to be different views from those kind of uh, sides of the mountain. And art is just one way up the mountain that has a specific set of views. Um, and the higher up you go, the more of the truth you see. It's different from other areas as well. So if we can kind of get that idea, on board with that idea that art isn't the pinnacle of achievement, art is just one of many ways that leads us to the truth. I think saying that something isn't art, I think that makes it easier for us to understand we're not saying it's not worthwhile, we're just saying it's not art. It's not walking up the mountain this side. And the only thing that would diminish the value of any of any un, you know undertaking or endeavor is the degree to which it does or doesn't lead to truth. Uh, so you know, science leads to truth, and math leads to truth, and philosophy can lead to truth, and and a variety of these things can lead to different truths. Uh, it's just the stuff that doesn't lead to truth that's of lesser value, but that's a separate discussion altogether. So uh, if we can kind of understand that idea that art is just one of the many ways up the mountain of truth, saying something isn't art doesn't really become controversial anymore. It's just uh, an issue of categorization, I guess. Okay, yeah, that's fair. I think the problem also like with people talking about art is they seem to think if it's not art, you're automatically saying it's not beautiful, it's not worthwhile, which is not necessarily what it means. Like, art's not the only thing that's worthwhile or sure. beautiful or leads to truth, essentially. Yeah, well, and there's plenty of art that's ugly, by the way. Um, so.
And, and, no, and plenty of good art that's ugly, yeah. right? So it's, art is not just about beauty. Art is about kind of leading us through these pathways up the mountain towards truth. And we can have revelatory experiences with ugly art and beautiful art and sort of anything in between there. So yeah, again, equating art with beauty is kind of very sort of, it's super narrow and it's not broad enough to encompass everything that art can and does do. So. Talking about all those different paths essentially to the top to get to truth, um, how did you decide what is along the path of art? Um, like what was your methodology? Yeah, so and, and again the book's called Not Art and while it's sort of tiptoeing again around the idea of what is art, uh, the, re the real sort of substance of the arguments in the book have to do with just saying what isn't art and the hope, and, you know, it's kind of like almost I don't know if uh, you've seen the uh, sort of the cat in the hat, um, you know, mi video they made I think in the 1950s. Um, anyway, there's this moment where they do this song about calculatus and eliminatus. Uh, basically, if we, we can find something we're looking for, if we find out where it's not, it's kind of like a goofy little, you know, song they sing, and they're saying, "Oh, the thing I'm looking for isn't here. Okay, it's not over here." And and by identifying all the places it isn't, they sort of jokingly presume they'll be able to find out where it is. Uh, and this is a little bit like that. Uh, it's, let's find out what isn't art. And at least by eliminating a bunch of things that aren't art, that will at least put us in the right, you know, the right space to at least be having fruitful conversations about art. Um, and so I, it occurred to me when I was thinking about how to make a, a tool that would really help these students of mine kind of go through some formal steps to kind of decide whether a thing wasn't was or wasn't art rather than just their taste because that's another thing is people equate art and the goodness of art with taste but taste has nothing to do with anything uh, and just a quick example I know this is a side note but a quick example of this is we've probably all encountered someone in our life that was obviously a good person but for whatever reason we kind of we just never gelled we uh, didn't care for them didn't want to spend time with them I know they're a good person but they just kind of maybe bugged you or something like that and that's an issue of taste, right? Uh, the fact that you don't want to hang around them or be with them or talk to them does not change the fact that they're good people, right? Taste, what does taste actually reflect? It reflects nothing about them, it merely reflects something about you, right? Um, and the reality is if someone's a good person, we should be able to, if we desire to be good people, we should be able to get along with them somehow. But, you know, we fight against that. And so the idea is that a lot of people equate art with their own personal taste, and taste really has nothing to do with anything. Taste is just, it reflects something about the viewer and the talker. It doesn't reflect anything about the actual subject itself, whether or not it's art. At any rate, I, you know, when I was thinking about trying to figure out how to kind of get away from my students' obsession with their own personal tastes, and to have something that's maybe a little bit more scientific, arguing out these points, I was thinking of Carl Linnaeus, the father of the kind of binomial nomenclature and the sort of classification of the natural world. You know, uh, kingdoms, you know, phylum, orders, species, all the, species, all these things. Uh, he was able to kind of create this taxonomy, this kind of levels, this strata of classification for all things in the natural world to figure out how things were interrelated, where they belonged, and things like that. And it occurred to me that a taxonomy like that could potentially be a valuable way for identifying in clean and simple terms, you know, what mostly what belongs outside of the realm of art. And so that was kind of uh, kind of the main thrust of the book. To be honest, the one part I remember, I can't remember exactly how you phrase it from the book, but essentially you said that art needs to be almost like premeditated, you know, like thought out mm -hmm. beforehand, which I would generally generally agree with on the other hand, you said it doesn't happen by accident. Sure. Um, I'm just trying to think of like the abstract expressionist. I know at least this is what some of them say is that it just happened. Like they just went to the canvas and did it. It wasn't really something that sure. was preconceived. Would you say that's not art or would you say it's kind of in between essentially those two categories? The idea is this, uh, and that's kind of a couple layers down in the taxonomy, we can talk about that uh, in a second here, but um, the idea of design, uh, art does not happen by accident, even if artists are willing to sort of take advantage of accidents or happenstance or things like that. Um, art only happens intentionally, and that's kind of like a, that's like a big kind of dividing point. There's many things 
that exist out there that were not deliberately created as art. And because they weren't deliberately created as art, they're not art, right? Because art is intentional. It has to be. Uh, it's a function of design. Now, the question of someone like uh, abstract expressionists who make sort of uh, free-flowing, spontaneous, kind of uh, invented works, you know, think about what it means to design. Design means to kind of deliberately take steps to sort of organize something. And so they didn't accidentally say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint on a canvas with oil paint. <laughs> And it's going to be this scale, and these are the colors that I'm going to use, and this is the size of the brush I'm going to use, uh, and these are the kinds of marks I'm going to make, right? So as spontaneous as you know, someone like uh, you know De Kooning might be, or Jackson Pollock, they've designed this thing, even if the outcome is not, you know, de design is taking deliberate steps intentionally to sort of organize uh, a hopeful kind of projected outcome. You know, no painting comes out exactly like anyone thought it would, but the act of saying, I'm going to make a painting, is a design decision. I'm going to make it this size, is a design decision. I'm going to use these tools, is a design decision. It's going to be this subject, or this process, or this method, or approach. Those are all design decisions. So even if something ends up being spontaneous, uh, you know, a form of art that ends up be, being spontaneous, it's, it's still a function of design. It's deliberate, it's intentional. You know, no one just was fiddling around in their workshop one day and accidentally said, I accidentally made art. It doesn't happen. It never happened. You know, it kind of reminds me of like a Terry Gilliam film. The History of Flight, I think is what it's called. And Terry Gilliam, you'll remember, is uh, the kind of animator for all the Monty Python movies and the Monty Python, the Holy Grail. And they have this kind of funny moment where suddenly, 300 years later, uh, in the workshop of so-and-so in Dusseldorf, oh my goodness, dear, I, I suddenly... Uh, <laughs> I, I discovered flight attendants or something like that. Like, you know, it's like, that's not how stuff happens, you know, with art. You don't sort of accidentally discover flight attendants or, or uh, you know, uh, boarding passes or things like that, like this Terry Gilliam film. You know, art is all, always intentional. It's, uh, it's completely intentional, even if it's allowed to be sort of spontaneous. So that, that may seem a little bit confusing, but, but all, all the choices that lead up to the creation of the art are design decisions, so it has to be a function of design. And anything that's not intentionally designed as art is not likely to be art. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, considering even just like a different type of art, like if someone goes up and writes on their notebook just like word vomits, um, even if they can get some like decent poetry out of it, it was still intentional to some degree. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Just I'm like trying. Uh, well, why? Down, yeah. Like, why am I even doing this in the yeah. first place? If you're using it as a creative process to, to kind of create ideas, then you're deliberately, intentionally doing, pursuing this spontaneous process. And so therefore it's a function of design and all, all art has to be a function of design or else it's not art. But one step down in the taxonomy, it occurs to me that maybe just kind of touching on a couple of the points of the taxonomy might be valuable. Um, you know, we're talking about truth is the highest level of achievement and human endeavor that leads towards truth mostly sort of find itself in three categories uh, and I just listed them in the book as you know procedure or technique is one of them you know uh, analysis is another one and creativity is another one you know example of procedure is like you know, something's like a formula you know you get a box of Legos it comes with a set of instructions on how to kind of create the Death Star out of these bits of Legos and you do the step-by-step -step thing and you eventually arrive at the Death Star. Is this a creative undertaking? It's not. Is this art? No. Because why? Because it's just a function of technique or procedure. You followed a set of steps to a predictable outcome. You know, just think of how factories, you know, routinely make stuff. It's just a uh, you know, we, we throw it through this machine for this amount of time and then it comes out this machine and we do this to it and then you get a predictable outcome. Um, and so procedure is one of the ways we arrive at truth, but it's all about sort of uh, going through the steps. It's like a, assembling IKEA furniture, right? Step by step by step. Um, I mean, I'm not an artist when I do that. When you do that, you are not an artist. <laughs> now, that's the, we'll, we'll get to that point, but you know, analysis is another thing. You know, an example to kind of explain these three ideas just really briefly is like someone that says, oh, I love cooking, uh, I'm a culinary artist, but all they do is follow recipes, I would say they're not being creative. They're just following a recipe. Now, the person who wrote the recipe was creative, right? Through trial and error, they sort of came up with an idea and it was successful and so then they recorded the steps so that other people could also have the same outcome. So uh, creating a recipe is creative, 
following a recipe is procedural and say you went to a restaurant that you really liked and you wanted to sort of eat that dish again and you sort of reverse engineered it, you kind of figured out what all the flavor caused the flavors and what the techniques were that created the textures and you reverse engineered the dish, that would be like a function of analysis, right? Anyway, the point is, is this top layer, procedure analysis and creativity, all art is creative or creative dominant. So anything that's not creative dominant is not likely to be art. You know, so something that's like technique or process based not likely, or procedure based, formulaic is less likely to be art, something that's totally analytical is also less likely to be art, and things that are creative are most likely to be art. And that's where we get to this idea of like different kinds of creativity, because you, you brought up the point of design and this kind of like spontaneous kind of uh, organic creativity, and it's the same thing there, kind of under creativity there's this kind of design and organic creativity. Uh, but since art is always intentional, all art has to kind of flow through design and rather than this sort of organic creativity. You know, there's a funny quote, Buckminster Fuller, famous designer, theoretician, creative, mentioned that, uh, you know, if you're on a ship and the ship sinks in the ocean and the sort of cargo hold sort of releases everything and it floats to the top and you see there's a piano top floating on the water and you kind of swim over to it, uh, the piano top can save your life, right? It can basically effectively act as a life preserver, but does that mean that all life preservers should be designed as piano tops? And the answer is no, right? So that's the, you know, this spontaneous organic creativity is when we sort of make the, almost these desperate attempts to make the best of what we've got. Um, and it's a form of creativity, but it's definitely a different form of creativity than design thinking, which is uh, all art must come from design. And then below design, you have, you know, these ideas of you can design a variety of things, you can design a product, you can de design a process, there's organizational design, there's sort of ideological design, uh, but since all art is a product or a production, uh, all art sort of flows through uh, product design. So that means like creating an organization like a company's bylaws or a constitution for a country or you know anything that has a you know, family chore chart, right? It's an a function of organizational design. You know, anything that's that's like that is not going to be art. Anything that's like uh, a philosophical or ideological design, like um, companies often kind of create their own little philosophy and ethos, you know, that sort of creativity is a function of design, but it's not art. Even creating a process is not art. Uh, showing people how to kind of go through a series of things to get a desired outcome, that's also not art. Art's always a product. And so anything that kind of comes under process, organizational, or ideological, ideological design, all those kind of layers of human endeavor are sort of out the window as, as not likely to be art. You know, you can ask yourself, well, all right, we've got product design, is that's, that's a kind of much narrower category, uh, it kind of gets rid of like a lot of stuff, but you know, you ask yourself, is everything that's a function of product design art? And of course not, right? Uh, it can't be. And, and one of the kind of key distinctions, if you ever read a uh, picture of Dorian Gray in the sort of foreword or introduction that Oscar Wilde writes there, he kind of talks about this, that uh, he kind of makes this point that all art is useless. And this kind of thought's also echoed in a lot of other places. Ovid mentions that there's nothing so useful to mankind as those arts which have no use. Uh, so there's this idea that's been floating around for basically millennia that art is useless. And what does that mean? That it has no function? That's not what it means. I think what they mean is like art has to be non-utilitarian. An example of that is, you know, Marcel Duchamp's fountain. His fountain is a urinal, which is a utilitarian object under normal circumstances, right? But he took it off the wall, right? And he put it, recontextualized it into a gallery space. It was no longer utilitarian. It was materially the same thing as the urinals in the gallery's men's room, but they were functional and his urinal was non-functional, right? And so there's this kind of thing about, uh, you know, functionality versus non-functionality that I think there's some strong arguments to be made there that art has to be non-utilitarian uh, in nature. And if something is primarily utilitarian in nature, um, it's less likely to be art. I often hear students saying, oh, shoes are art, this is art, and that's art, and the other things the, is art. But oftentimes the things that they're mentioning are art are primarily functional, kind of utilitarian objects. It's not to say that those things couldn't become art, but again, they'd have to be recontextualized, reimagined as art. 
just the way uh, Marcel Duchamp sort of recontextualized and reimagined intentionally this sort of urinal as a piece of art. Uh, a company manufactures a hammer. Uh, the primary function of a hammer is to hammer nails. That's utilitarian. It's a tool. Like, there's nothing more utilitarian than that. Uh, but a lot of times you go to these junk shops or sort of antique shops and you can find these old-fashioned hammers and cross-cut saws and who knows what that are kind of really cool and rustic looking and some people like use them to hang on their walls as decorations, right? And uh, suddenly they're no longer utilitarian objects. They're objects that are intended to be non-utilitarian, in fact. There is a little bit of fluidity f between what a thing is uh, and what it may eventually become, but again, if it's going to be art, it has to be intentionally designed to be made into art, and all art is non-utilitarian in nature, at least if uh, Ovid or Oscar Wilde are to, are to be believed. Uh, and others. And so that, that leaves us with, okay, so what products, what design products are non-utilitarian in nature? Well, a lot of them will fall into the following three categories. One is decoration, we just talked about that. Uh, we have the arts, which includes, you know, the visual arts, the performing arts, and the literary arts. And then we've also got entertainment. And these kind of three things are very kind of closely connected. And there's definitely overlap between them. But decoration, you know, it's interesting. The root word for decoration comes from an old English word that means, you know, to cover blemishes with makeup. You know, the purpose of decoration is almost to kind of, it's all about surface. It's all about sort of tricking the eye and fooling the eye. It's almost just a form of deception, right? It's about changing the surface of the thing rather than its substance and so a lot of decoration doesn't really qualify as art and you have to kind of determine that for yourself as you're looking at stuff but you know I was just thinking of uh, you know HGTV I used to show this to one of my classes we'd go to the HGTV website and they'd say make art for your bedroom and then they had this like step-by-step -step thing of like get some barn wood cut it into these lengths assemble it together and put a frame around it you've made art and it's like <laughs> No, you've made decoration, right? I mean, it's like, it's like a different thing altogether. Entertainment is often, again, there's overlap here, but enter entertainment has sort of different objections often than art does. And so when you kind of get down through the taxonomy of oh, what are all these things that humans do and which of them qualify as art, you sort of filter down through, oh, is it a function of design? Is it creative? Is it a product? Is it a non-utilitarian product? Okay, yeah, here we've got down to all the way down to the bottom. So does that mean it's automatically art? And the answer is no, right? Uh, there's many things in decoration and entertainment that aren't art, but there are many things within the arts that aren't art as well. I mean, just think of like, you know, Harlequin romance novels or sort of, you know, just like bad choreographies or, you know, there's stuff out there that just doesn't really qualify as art. And if you want to call it art, call it lowercase a art, right? But, you know, the art that we typically talk about when we're talking about art is like uppercase A art. And the sort of distinction between lowercase a art and uppercase a art is its capacity to engender revelation, right? So if you're sort of down at that bottom of the taxonomy and you've got non-utilitarian, you know, uh, products of non-utilitarian product design in front of you and trying to decide, is this art or is it not? Just the, qu the key question is like, is this... Is there any truth available through this? Am I sort of being elevated at all? Is there an insight or a revelatory experience that this will lead me to? And if the answer is yes, it's much more likely that you're looking at art with a capital A. And if the answer is no, I'm not getting any insight, I'm not getting any revelation, there's no sort of potential to elevate my gaze by looking at this thing or encountering this thing, then what you end up with is something that's very likely not to be art, even though it is in this kind of lowest layer of the taxonomy. The first thing that came to mind is that they might feel gypped or like the cer ceramic <laughs> makers oh, sure. like that. Just because it's like it's like a it's like a craft, it can be it can be utilitarian but it also can be highly decorative. I know at least today lots sure. of people, you know, if it's a pot for a flower pot that's utilitarian, but if they're just doing it for decor, then you know, decoration, so it's still not art. Well, Lower like I said, there, there's oh, there's overlap. So there's decoration yeah. that is compelling, that's insightful, that engenders revelation, that I think can certainly qualify as art. I'm not totally throwing decoration under the bus. I'm not totally throwing entertainment under the bus either, because I think there is entertainment that is also uh, can lead to insights, it can engender revelation, it can elevate your gaze, it can be compelling. Uh, and so that's the deciding factor. It's not whether is it just a function of the arts, it's art. That's not true either because there's, as we've mentioned, functions of the arts that are not art. So you have to kind of determine once you get this far down in the taxonomy, 
on a case-by-case -case basis. So for example, you go to Walmart and you can see these giant planners that were made in sweatshops, right, uh, uh, you know, by eight-year-old kids. And the question is, is that art? Well, it's, you know, it's clay, like a ceramic artist uses, it's glaze, it's kind of thrown on a wheel, like the process is very similar, it's fired. And many of them are beautiful, so does that make them art? And the answer is no, they're not art. <laughs> Number one, they're like made, they're function, pure functions of procedure rather than creativity, and that sort of dismisses them instantly out of hand. But the other one is that, like, look, they're uh, mostly decorative, right? They're decorative, or they're 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 partially functional, and if they're not purely functional, they're purely decorative, and that sort of you know that sort of realm of being, hey, it's functional, it's performing a function, but it's got a slight wrinkle of decorative quality to it. You know, you can look at the Walmart planners and. It's, I think we can all agree those aren't art. Uh, I hope we can agree that. And that was an example I'd always give in my classes. I'd say, look, here's a Walmart planner, and here's like a ceramic vessel by Chris Gustin, you know, famous, you know, museum ceramic artist, right? And the major difference is, uh, you know, Chris Gustin's works phenomenally higher quality, much more compelling. But that's not even the point. The point is his his works are non-utilitarian, so. Um, but even that's beside the point when you come to this idea of like revelatory power. His works are extremely compelling to look at, whereas there's very little insight to be gotten from a planner, right? Um, and so, yes, yeah, so there's some, there, you know, think about Carl Linnaeus' taxonomy. Not everything fit in exactly. A uh, perfect example of this is the, uh, is the, uh, the water mole, or also known as the platypus, right? Um, you know, the platypus, it's like, oh well, wait, it's, it's warm-blooded, it's got hair, right? So that's like a mammalian characteristic, but it's got like flappy duck feet and a duck bill, which are these like avian, and, and, it, and it lays eggs, right? These are like avian or bird-like attributes, but then it also, the male has a poison or venomous spur, which is like a, you know, reptilian or like uh, insectoid or, you know, um, you know, underwater creature sort of, um, characteristics. So it's like, where do we put this? Where do we put the uh, platypus? Is it a, you know, is it a this? Is it a that? Is it a that? It becomes very difficult, right? And you got to sort of make kind of new categories to accommodate for those things. I think ceramics and a lot of the crafts are sort of in that sort of um, that uh, platypus territory, where a lot of the products of the crafts can be art, and a lot of the products of the crafts could, depending on what their purpose is and what their function and what the design is, could potentially trend towards other things. But the same can be true for painting. The same could be true for sculpture. The same could be true for photography. You know, an example I give in the book with photography is that you go to like a Sears photo studio and you have, you know, a teenager there, you know, you, you kind of stand in front of the backdrop and they've got this like they flip the switch and all this kind of prearranged lighting's there and the camera's already preset for the scenario and they just push the button, right? Um, you know, that's not creative. That's like a function of procedure. So there's photography, an art medium, but it's not making art because the way it's being made is not art-like. It's like forensic uh, photography when you go to a crime scene and you photograph all this stuff. That's analytical in nature. It's not, it's not creative. Um, and so that's not art, right? So, you, you know, you, you can say like ceramics can be art and it can be not art, but you can say the same of everything that's art. Painting can be art, it can be not art. Sculpture can be art, it can be not art. Photography can be art and can be not art. You know, liter you know, you know uh, the literary arts, you can have things that are certainly art and you can have things in there that are not art. With the music, you can have things that are art and you can have things that are sort of primarily entertainment based. You know, we don't categorize art just by the medium. And that's what I would say to someone that does ceramics. I was like, you know, the medium you do is kind of decide or predetermine whether what you're doing is art or not. Um, it's what you're doing with it that predetermines how you're using it, what your intentions are, uh, are what predetermines whether it's an art thing that you're making or not. I mean, it's the same with music, uh, just as a last example. When everyone kind of everyone who starts learning how to play the piano. Um, you know, start learning scales and arpeggios, right? Well, uh, but that's not, that's not, no one calls that music. Those are the building blocks of music, you know? I teach a drawing class and we, we teach analytical skills, right? Which are valuable skills to have as an artist, but it's a fairly non-creative class. And so I tell my students, guys, we're just making drawings. We're not making art in here. We're kind of looking at a thing. We're sort of developing skills at how you can sort of observe and interpret things. But this class is primarily non-creative. And so therefore you're not making art. You're just making drawings, right? Um, 
So, you know, I recognize even within my own disciplines that a lot of, uh, a lot of the potential tasks that I do could be not art, or they could be art, just depending on intention. What came to mind, too, for me was, like, films. Like, some of them are pure entertainment, but sure. some of them, you know, are actually worthwhile. <laughs> and some <laughs> are, some are neither entertaining nor worthwhile, <laughs> right? So you've got a whole range of things in there, too. Yeah. So it, it just, it's, it depends, but the thing is, like, um, kind of back uh, to what you said, like, just because it's not art doesn't mean it's not beautiful or not worthwhile. And stuff sure, like that. So, right, yeah. You know. So all we're saying is when we say something is not art uh, is... Uh, is that look you could still potentially uh, claw your way up the mountain of truth with that thing it's just clawing its way up the mountain on a different part of the mountain than art is and that's the key point right is that whatever we're doing we want to sort of be undertaking endeavors that sort of lead us to truth uh, rather than things that sort of do not elevate us um, and whether we're sort of elevating our gaze on the side of the mountain where art is or on the side of the mountain where some other discipline is that's the main point and it's not really a value judgment when you say something's not art and you're just merely saying it's just not climbing the mountain on this side and it's good it's climbing it on a different side with different views so. yeah but it's still the mountain of truth so. yeah yeah and then they can also they will all converge at some point so